Bonjour à toutes et tous. Hello everyone. Donc, uh, cette séance, on va parler aujourd'hui. Now, this session is uh, dedicated to HIV and TB, uh, among other things. La découverte aussi de cette maladie, uh, VIH, uh, ça a entraîné quand même jusqu'ici plus de HIV. Uh, has affected more than 40 million people, and according to WHO, 39 million people are infected with HIV and live with this disease. In 2022, more than 600,000 people died directly from uh, AIDS uh, and HIV, and 1.3 million new infections uh, uh, were reported in 2022. Since the uh, virus was discovered, major uh, progress has been made for diagnosis and management uh, of these patients. However, it remains a major public health challenge. And uh, if you consider 1.3 million new infections uh, in 2022, uh, you get the uh, notion of the scale. Now, uh, there has been some progress in different sectors, uh, and the MOH in various countries have improved. Uh, so we uh, focus more now on models of care and how to best accompany the patients who uh, are sometimes uh, in difficult positions for diagnosis, treatment, and also uh, find it difficult to get in touch with the different support services uh, uh, that may accompany these patients in their, um, in their um, uh, care uh, uh, path. Uh, there are going to be three uh, uh, communications, and uh, over to my colleague, Etienne, who is going to be my co-moderator. Hello, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, thought it was interesting to look at the differentiated models uh, faced with the uh, scale of the epidemic. Uh, there is a very strong mobilization uh, among people living with HIV and also uh, uh, their uh, relatives. Uh, so there was a huge mobilization, and this led to uh, uh, models of care that were uh, that are uh, specific or were specific, and depending on the uh, uh, environment, it uh, became more and more uh, uh, frequent. And as of 2014 and 2015, in particular, in the uh, uh, paper published in uh, Tropical Medicine and uh, Health, and uh, with the involvement of the uh, of MSF Belgium, uh, there was some formalization of the differentiated models of care. It was argued that you can't just use the same model for all patients, and that it should be fine-tuned depending on the resources and the patients. Uh, HR uh, uh, are a major factor and availability of HR. Uh, so as of the uh, mid-2000, uh, 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 year, the years 2000, different uh, models of services uh, became more organized. And uh, as of 2015, this, was, uh, this sort of strategy was extended uh, to, other, uh, to other international uh, players, such as the, uh, uh, the uh, global funds, uh, with uh, more uh, tailored uh, strategies with, of course, uh, financing uh, for these activities. We are going to focus on this differentiated approach in the field. And this is, uh, I think, the main uh, the main point of our session. And uh, we need also to realize that these large-scale strategies at international level go through ministries and the regulating uh, the regulatory bodies. Uh, it's all very well, but what about the uh, uh, more vulnerable uh, uh, population in a humanitarian uh, setting? And be it for HIV or TB, uh, thinking about the models of care is may prove useful not only for TB but uh, and HIV, but also 
for chronic disease uh, management and the chronic care programmatic uh, tra tra training and guidelines uh, uh, has become a focus for MSF to know how we can improve uh, the, the, the care for these patients. Now, the first uh, presentation is exploring patient preferences and assessing their outcome. The example of new differentiated models of HIV care delivery in DRC and Uganda among people living with HIV, PLHIV. Um, uh, Jihad Ben Farad is an epidemiologist uh, with Epicentre. Uh, she uh, is specialized in HIV in East Africa. She coordinates uh, uh, action on differentiated models of care for uh, PL uh, uh, HIV, uh, and she's also she also provides operational support in uh, Kenya, Malawi, uh, Uganda, and DRC. And uh, she's going to give us this uh, uh, communication. Thank you very much, Chris. Hello, everyone. Indeed, I'm an epidemiologist, and I'm going to share with you uh, MSF's experience with uh, the uh, ro uh, rolling out of differentiated models in DRC and Uganda. Now, uh, just to uh, set up the scene, uh, now uh, Chris gave you a few statistics, but close to 30 million people uh, live with HIV in the world, and uh, the greatest burden is in the uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, with uh, close to 25.6 million people with HIV. Uh, WHO and UNAIDS uh, uh, set out some objectives to eradicate the, uh, the pandemic by 2030, and also uh, it started with a cascade uh, of care, the 1990 uh, so-called cascade, or uh, now uh, 95. Uh, and then uh, in the uh, year 2010, uh, uh, WHO and uh, UNAIDS uh, uh, proposed strategies for uh, management of HIV uh, uh, and also to accompany uh, the differentiated models uh, uh, in uh, for their deployment in various countries. So uh, differentiated uh, service delivery, DSD, is a recipient uh, 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 care-centered uh, approach that simplifies and adapts HIV services to the preferences and needs of people living with HIV. So the patient is really at the heart of the uh, uh, of the uh, of care, access to treatment, access to uh, lab tests, and the patient can choose among a number of uh, uh, possibilities in terms of uh, time uh, and uh, and sites and people uh, in, in charge of the uh, of care, and it's also a way to uh, reallocate resources to those who uh, uh, most need them. Now, among the uh, differentiated models that are well documented, uh, uh, there are uh, um, you have the CLAD uh, or CCLAD, uh, uh, it's community uh, uh, client-led ERT uh, delivery, uh, and uh, uh, there is uh, access to suppressed viral load. Let's turn now to MSF's experience in two uh, challenging HIV uh, uh, care context, and uh, I'm going to tell you about these challenges uh, later. Now, the first example is uh, GOMA in DRC. Now, a snapshot of this uh, uh, epidemic in DRC, prevalence is uh, estimated at 1.2%. Uh, MOH uh, uh, suggested the decentralization and integration of HIV activities into health services, uh, traditional health services. In 2016, uh, MOH implemented the test and treat strategy, and in 2018, they developed an operational plan for for the provision of differentiated services. Now, MSF in Goma, we uh, cooperate with the MOH, and in March 2021, we supported uh, the MOH to roll out the uh, uh, CAG, uh, the uh, Community Art uh, Group, uh, ART group, community ART group. As uh, Chris and Etienne were saying, uh, 
par quel mode H, uh, HIV, PLHIV uh, uh, patient was asked about what they preferred to have, whether it is uh, something traditional with a monthly clinical uh, consultation, um, so the same follow-up uh, they've uh, always had, or uh, to join a community ART group uh, uh, and then just go once a month to the to the clinic to get their uh, viral load tested. So we accompanied the uh, uh, deployment of these models. We uh, measured uh, continuum uh, uh, continuity of care uh, indicators, uh, such, such as retention in care and suppression of viral load. And we also wanted to document the, the, their satisfaction rate. Uh, I'm just going to tell you about retention in care at 12 months after the start of deployment and patient satisfaction. We were a bit worried, you see. Uh, there was a, One of the concerns was uh, that uh, uh, leaving patients uh, free to choose what they wanted to do, we uh, were afraid that maybe they were going to be lost to follow up, and this is why we wanted to document in a robust way the number of patients who opted for, uh, uh, for CAG and uh, who nonetheless continued to get access to treatment. Now, these results, uh, we analyzed uh, close to 2,000 people in the cohort, and we analyzed retention in care using a Kaplan-Meier analysis, uh, which is a frequently used a statistical analysis tool, and we uh, documented uh, retention at six months and one year uh, for uh, uh, CAG uh, uh, clients, and you can see that 96% of, uh, uh, of uh, patients in uh, CAG uh, uh, were retained in care. Now, patient satisfaction, we uh, used uh, a cross-sectional survey among the active, uh, of the active cohort with a satisfaction questionnaire that we uh, designed ourselves. Uh, and uh, the questions were exchanges with other members, confidentiality within the group, mutual support between members of the group, reviewing of uh, renewing of ART, load follow-up, and organization of the group. And uh, in light blue uh, and uh, dark blue, uh, dark blue for very satisfied. You can see that satisfied and very satisfied uh, that uh, was the majority of patients vis-à-vis -vis this model. Now, let's turn to KCC in Uganda. KCC is in the western part of the country. Now, going back to the epidemic, the prevalence is different. The burden of the disease is uh, higher because 5.8% uh, or close to 6% 6, 6 of people live with HIV. However, they quickly reach the 1990-90 cascade, uh, i.e. Uh, UN AIDS uh, objectives. They also rolled out uh, several strategies recommended by WHO and UNAIDS uh, so as to reduce the frequency of consultation in clinics and uh, prioritize persons uh, who are the most at need. So uh, they deployed uh, test and treat in 2016 and also differentiated services delivery models. Uh, now, going back to uh, MSF context and our program in KCC, uh, we closed the program in 2017, but as of 2017, MSF and the MOH delivered high-quality HIV care uh, to fishing uh, communities in KCC. In this region, there are lots of people who uh, rely on fishing uh, for their livelihood, whether because they fish themselves or sell fish. And uh, a survey carried out by Epicentre showed that these uh, communities uh, just follow the uh, shoals of fish and uh, therefore they are very mobile, so it's complicated to ensure c continuity of care uh, and uh, suppression of viral load. So this is why we opted for this project. We offered uh, two differentiated models to these patients. They could still go to the clinic every three months, but uh, they, were, they had a, a, a priority a a card, and they could go to the pharmacy uh, right away and get their treatment without having uh, uh, a, a appointment with a doctor, 
or uh, so this, what it's called FTDR, or they could go through the CLAD, uh, Community Client-Led ART Delivery. And then we uh, compared uh, characteristics of uh, uh, patients uh, um, choosing FTDR or uh, uh, CLAD uh, to describe the, um, uh, um, to see why uh, uh, or what could explain their choice, they also describe their re the retention in care, uh, also the very low uh, suppression, uh, and also we wanted to evaluate the acceptability and relevance of uh, DSD models in this community. And just like uh, for GOMA, I'm going to tell you about just two outcomes uh, 12, at 12 months, uh, i.e. Uh, retention in care and patient satisfaction. Retention in care at 12 months, uh, we uh, carried out a retrospective data analysis uh, for 1,773 patients. Uh, because we do have a three-year follow-up, uh, in fact, our uh, lines are uh, go a bit uh, further. But uh, uh, at one year, 91% of FTDR uh, clients were retained in care, and 97% of cloud uh, patients retained in care. So we are uh, way beyond uh, and above the objectives uh, for uh, of uh, UN AIDS to eradicate uh, the uh, disease or the pandemic, rather. For patient satisfaction, we. Uh, uh, carried out uh, 38 interviews and five focus groups uh, the, for CLAD uh, or for FTDR. Uh, the perception was very positive. Uh, uh, the first one, uh, uh, an example of what they tell us uh, in the CLAD group, uh, uh, a, a person, a man saying, I like the initiative so much that when I am absent, I'm able to receive my drugs uh, and they uh, still bring my drugs to my home when I'm uh, busy elsewhere. And that's why I like the group. And then a woman in the FTDR group saying, I have no problem to get ART services uh, because when I uh, uh, go there, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, on Thursday or Saturday, I get a refill. They treat us very well. Uh, you, won't be any to, you won't be able to find anyone complaining about the ERT services, as far as I know. So the conclusion, uh, DSD uh, models, uh, when uh, well adapted to communities, uh, ensure good retention and uh, high acceptance, uh, even in mobile communities. It uh, shows that it's important to be patient-centered and uh, specific and adapted to the context so that you uh, can really uh, uh, offer something that is tailored to these uh, patients' needs. So uh, we know that uh, uh, a differentiated approach to the uh, P uh, PLV, uh, to the person living with HIV, is absolutely needed. I would like to thank uh, um, uh, those who helped me. Uh, and also the participants in Cassese and Goma, and uh, uh, and also uh, uh, the Co Kinshasa and Kampala coordination teams, and Chris for the support. Thank you very much, Gian, for this uh, uh, very uh, interesting uh, presentation. We're going to keep the questions for the uh, end of uh, the three communications. Uh, uh, now, let's go on with uh, uh, another uh, communications uh, leading us to the Central African Republic. Uh, it's going to be a duet uh, to uh, highlight the complementarity of uh, quantitative and qualitative approach. Uh, first, Valentina. Uh, Valentina is a biologist uh, with a master in public health at Pasteur Institute in Paris. She joined Epicentre in 2015. Uh, first, she, she worked in Kenya uh, to coordinate uh, study, and then in Paris. And before Epicentre, she uh, uh, also uh, worked with DNDI on, uh, uh, on sleep disease in uh, DRC and uh, CAR. And she also worked as a biologist in several uh, African countries, and she uh, has a specialty uh, in HIV and uh, hepatitis. Uh, uh, Pascal Lissouba is uh, joined uh, Epicentre in 2016. She is a field epidemiologist. She carried out several missions in Africa and Southeast Asia uh, in a, a stable and emergency context. She's a focal point for the technical group in charge of uh, looking at uh, 
uh, mixed method, uh, uh, and she has been a, uh, also a researcher with INSERM. Now, uh, and the title of their communication is Challenges and lessons of implementing models of, uh, uh, and more particularly differentiated uh, uh, models of HIV care in Carnot in CAR. It's in the western part of the country. Over to them. Hello, everyone. After several uh, years, uh, we uh, are uh, at long last in a position to tell you about the outcomes of this uh, study uh, uh, D uh, on DSD models, uh, uh, still for HIV, but in another context, uh, since it is in uh, uh, in uh, Carno in. Uh, so, uh, central uh, in car now uh, there's still uh, this epidemic in uh, central uh, and western uh, africa uh, neglected by uh, funding and policies due to lower hiv prevalence versus other regions in car uh, it's one of the highest uh, in uh, central africa and political instability and the uh, and also the vulnerability of the health system of weakened strategies to fight hiv and the cascade of care uh, is uh, full of loopholes uh, there are some efforts to improve retention in care uh, is still uh, needed uh, since 2009, MSF has been uh, co cooperating with MOH in Carnot. Uh, prevalence is estimated at uh, 5%. Carnot Hospital is the uh, only health district center where patients can be screened and, uh, and uh, started on treatment. This is done in the uh, uh, follow-up uh, clinic with a, a comprehensive, free, and integrated care for patients uh, on an OPD basis uh, um, uh, and for HIV. According to the national program, uh, DSD models are used. As we uh, were told by Jian, the, uh, uh, these DSD uh, models, uh, um, in fact, uh, encourage uh, retention in care because it's based on their preferences. But then, of course, provided they are stable from the clinical point of view and adhere to treatment. Now, uh, in Carnot, uh, we uh, started in 2018. The patients uh, go to the hospital twice every three months, uh, and uh, uh, so that uh, if the, there's a rap, uh, fast track refill, and uh, uh, so that uh, the community based uh, group can also. Uh, uh, get their ART. Uh, oh, that's another uh, possibility. Uh, uh, and uh, decentralized sites uh, are available since 2016. 558 uh, patients are uh, grouped in 122 uh, CAGs. However, uh, the uh, dynamic for their creation changed over a year with a tendency downwards uh, in the past year. With regard to the decentralized services, they are 350 patients and patients uh, uh, that uh, who are eligible uh, get access to them only uh, two months after they were uh, started on treatment uh, in Carnot if they uh, it is confirmed that they comply with treatment there are three decentralized sites uh, where we have this uh, on offer out of the 28 in the district so the geographical coverage isn't sufficient in terms of decentralization on the basis of a number of challenges uh, that we made in the field, we carried out a study with uh, the main objective of describing and understanding the uh, continuum of uh, care for uh, patients living with HIV in Carno. We are going to show uh, only a section of the outcomes uh, uh, while focusing on describe description of models of care, the impact on retention, uh, compliance, and uh, perception by patients. The method methodology uh, was the following one, retrospective ana analysis of the uh, program data between 2011 and 
2022 across sectional survey with uh, 340 patients uh, uh, of at least five years, uh, and there is a genotypical uh, a genotype resistance test in the qualitative survey uh, with approximately 90 participants in the active uh, uh, in the active queue uh, and patients uh, uh, who uh, lacked uh, uh, who were not compliant uh, since at least six months. Now, towards the end of 2022, the cohort uh, had more than 4,745 patients on treatment, 46% of them in the active queue, uh, and uh, a large proportion were, de de were described as lost to follow-up. Here on the, on the chart, you can see the retention in care uh, up to 48 months after the start of treatment, but this shows uh, uh, what happens for the three uh, DSD uh, models. Uh, you can see that the likelihood of retention in care goes down over time, and despite the uh, DSD models as of uh, 2016, well, retention hasn't been improved. Now, another indicator, uh, which is the surrogate uh, 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 of, uh, measure, uh, measurement for uh, compliance with uh, treatment, uh, um, the majority of patients uh, comply um, uh, at, with, uh, with at a level of under 80 percent, so 20 uh, percent of appointments are not uh, uh, complied with. Viral suppression and uh, ARV uh, resistance uh, are also indicators uh, of uh, compliance. The results of the uh, cross-sectional uh, survey uh, uh, is an interesting snapshot three years uh, after uh, the introduction of of uh, uh, Tegravir, a very promising uh, uh, drug that is uh, uh, well or be uh, whose tolerance is, be is, is better. 341 people, a majority of women, were randomly selected in the active, uh, in the active uh, file, uh, active uh, Q patients. Uh, majority. Uh, uh, had uh, uh, was based on DTG. 27% uh, uh, of patient, patients had a, a, a viral load that could be detected, and 12% uh, with a virological uh, failure. When we carried out the resistance uh, test, uh, some one third uh, showed resistance to uh, uh, the category of these two uh, drugs that are used with uh, uh, DTG and. Uh, the uh, resistance uh, figures are relatively low, and it shows that the non-suppressed viral load is mainly due to the lack of adherence to treatment. Now, Pascal is going to tell you about the uh, uh, qualitative uh, results. Merci, Valentina, et bonjour à tous. Thank you, Valentina, and good morning to you all. Now, before I look at the qualitative aspects, I would like to uh, tell you something about the uh, care models which are available in the clinic. As you can see, in the yellow on the right here, the patients who do not benefit from differentiated care models, including eligible patients who are more than three months late, have the conventional classic uh, model, model of care, and they have to go to the clinic every three months wants to uh, renew their treatment. Alors, je vais donc vous now, I'm going to present the perceptions on the differentiated uh, care models and the reported reasons for non adherence to treatment in order to have an overview of the uh, uh, care experience of those patients. Now, perceptions of differentiated models of care. The plurimensual um, supply is uh, seen very positively because it reduces the workload of the healthcare professionals and the waiting times for patients. They appreciate the fact that the treatment is available and for free. And many of them said that it was the main reason why they chose the Carnot hospitals to be taken care of. The CAGs are considered to be the most promising models to support patient retention. But of course, they work differently. Some patients are very satisfied, and others mention dysfunctions, such as disagreements among members, uh, breach of confidentiality, and sometimes uh, uh, 
ARVs being stolen. This is why the patients sometimes withdraw from the CAGs or won't integrate them. And the healthcare professionals mention management systems which are not systematic and which are not standardized, and that can be a problem. And the feedback on the decentralized is uh, actually mixed. Patients appreciate the fact that ARVs are available, but they are sorry that the other services in the care package are not available, such as treatment for opportunistic diseases and therapeutic education, for which they must go to the Carnot Hospital. They also would like a more holistic uh, care that would include essential primary care also. And for the reasons of non-adherence, we used as a proxy uh, people coming late for their appointment at the clinic. The patients face access barriers due to the distance, for example, to the hospital, the insecurity on the, on the way, and the cost and availability of transportation, which very often prevent them from coming on time to uh, receive care. And as one patient says, some barriers can actually be accumulated. And uh, when the patients go back to the conventional model, these barriers, these obstacles are even increased. In terms of the services in the follow-up clinic, there are several challenges. First of all, a crowd of patients who come without an appointment. This generates um, too much work for healthcare professionals and waiting times that can go up to several hours for patients. The quality of care is impacted. Several healthcare professionals uh, said that they could not dedicate enough time to uh, um, helping and supporting patients, and some patients lack knowledge about the care that they receive, biological tests and ARV. And as uh, somebody said, the patients who don't understand the system and what they're supposed to do are patients that we're going to lose because they don't understand how important the treatment is. Then there's also stigma. This is a significant factor for non adherence or even for losing patients. As indicated in those key words, you see that the patients report a lot of negative experience, bullying, abuse, uh, or insults, or verbal abuse and discrimination because of their status. They are ashamed, they are afraid that their status is going to be revealed, and so it can make them uh, reluctant to come to the uh, um, hospital or clinic. And this is very often why people won't integrate the CAGS or the decentralized care model. And then you have all context-related factors linked to the living conditions. Sometimes the patients have to go away from uh, the where they live in order to uh, make a living. The lack of food supply is also something that all patients report as one of the major difficulties because the treatment actually provokes hunger and has a certain number of side effects. A vast majority of patients also report difficulties in the social environment, lack of support, and all this has an impact on their physical and mental well-being and also has a negative impact on their adherence to care and uh, to treatment. Alors, en conclusion, now, in conclusion, this study shows that despite the implementation of differentiated models of care for a few years, the retention indicators in uh, and adherence indicators are suboptimal in the cohort. The results also indicate that uh, scaling up the models of care is not appropriate, especially for the CAGs on decentralization. This is a promising system, but it does not totally meet the patient's needs. And also, looking at the challenges that patients are facing, we think that differentiated models of care could help uh, improve their commitment, but those who would benefit the most are excluded because of the eligibility criteria. We have made a certain number of recommendations for the differentiated models of care. We recommend to improve their implementation uh, in order to reach their full potential. Apparently, for example, with a a uh, system for CAGs, we would have a broader um, care offer in decentralized uh, facilities and scale up the viral load for a better clinical follow-up. We would also need to review the eligibility criteria. And also, we should develop uh, care strategies that would be more targeted and less punitive for the patients who are non-adherent. And we also recommend uh, developing together 
together uh, community campaigns to fight against social stigma, because this is really a problem, and we would need to collaborate with civil society and patients' associations. We also would like to develop advocacy actions with the Ministry of Health and other partners in order to support a wider scale of implementation for this differentiated approach with a holistic approach of patients' management that should take also into account and take care of their other priority needs. We would like to thank all the participants to the study, our partners at the Ministry of Health and the District of Carnot, our MSF colleagues and Epicentre in uh, CAR and Paris, all the uh, co-investigators and our research team without whom we would not have been able to carry out this study. And thank you very much for your attention. And the third talk for today will be about community household child contact investigation for tuberculosis. And uh, Dr. Anka Vasiliu is going to give the talk. She is a medical doctor specialized in public health. The specific focus on tuberculosis in developing countries. And most specifically, pediatric TB. Getting her diploma in Romania, she uh, went to Rouen. Uh, to be a fellow there, and she obtained a, a master's in public health in Pasteur, and she conducted her internship in Cambodge. And and she then went to Uganda, where she worked on her PhD on a randomized controlled trial for the evaluation of a community-based intervention for the investigation of contact cases in households and the management of preventative therapies for uh, uh, household uh, child contacts with TB. She is now a postdoc researcher in the World TB program in the Bear College, and she continues to uh, investigate about uh, tuberculosis because this is one of her passions. Thank you very much. We are going to move into the world of TB. We have a lot to learn from the HIV models, and I'm going to give my talk in English. I will present today uh, our intervention about um, community household child contact investigation for tuberculosis. Um, so the WHO estimates that there are 1.3 million children with TB and more than 200,000 of these children die. Uh, this represents 12% of the global TB burden uh, and also 16% of the global TB mortality. So you see there's a gap between these um, estimates. And highlighting this gap in diagnosis and treatment, we uh, estimate that 58% of children under five years are underdiagnosed under or underreported. Many of these children uh, get tuberculosis in their households. Therefore, the WHO recommends TB preventive treatment in the households of these children. Um, there are uh, different regimens, and the one we are going to highlight today and focus on is three months of rifampicin and isoniazid. Um, in 2022, there were less than 37% of household contacts who actually received TPT. And in the countries that we uh, did this research in, uh, in Cameroon and Uganda, so there have been 1.3% eligible contacts receiving TPT in Cameroon, and 73% in Uganda. And these percentages were even lower when we developed the intervention. The current recommendation is for the person who has TB to bring their household uh, contacts at the health facility for TB screening. Um, and this is focused um, on children under five. But there are many challenges, as we know, um, first of all, time scheduling challenges, uh, financial difficulties, the distance from the health center, and also stigma and disclosure issues that are still very present in the TB world. 
So we proposed a solution to send teams um, in, into the households to do community household TB screening for these children and TPT management. So the objective of this project is to compare the proportion of household contact children who start and complete TPT between a community-based model and the standard of care. So this is called the contact study. Contact comes from community intervention for TB active contact tracing and preventive therapy management. This is a study funded by UNITAID through the CAPTV project. Um, it's been led by Institut de Recherche pour le Développement, and it's been implemented in Uganda through Epicenter and in Cameroon through EGPAF. The project had three phases. First of all, in the baseline phase, we looked at retrospective data from the registers and we checked the quality of these data. And also we uh, um, asked the patients and caregivers if this intervention would be acceptable and we adjusted it according to our findings. In the intervention phase, we recruited and followed out the participants. And in the explanatory phase, we analyzed the data. Uh, we did the cost-effectiveness analysis and also the post-intervention acceptability. Um, it's a multi-center randomized control trial with 20 clusters. Um, these clusters are 10, 10 clusters in each country. And in Uganda, the intervention took place in the southwest region and in Cameroon, in littoral et uh, région centre. Uh, there are two parallel arms. One is the intervention, which is the household uh, community-based intervention, and the other one is the standard of care, which is facility-based. Um, for the inclusion criteria, we included index cases, so people diagnosed with TB in the previous month, who accept the household visit. And then when we went into the households, we had a secondary inclusion criteria for household contacts, and we included all ages. In the standard of care, all activities are facility-based. And these activities are TB diagnosis, TB contact screening, investigation for symptomatic contacts, also TPT initiation, follow-up, and completion. Everything happens at the facility, at the health facility. In the intervention arm, the index case is diagnosed in the health facility, but after this, we send a team in the household to screen all household members. So we screen for TB symptoms and also for critical signs in case um, any child has uh, important critical signs and they need to be referred for a health assessment. And also we propose HIV testing to everyone. If there are symptoms, uh, the household contacts are referred to the health facility for uh, investigations that are available there. Um, this visit is done by a community health worker. Then this community health worker identifies the contacts who would need TPT. There's a second visit by a nurse, because only a nurse can prescribe TPT. And uh, we prescribe the uh, TPT to children under five, and also children 5 to 14 living with HIV. Also, the nurse makes sure that the child doesn't have any symptoms, so there's a secondary assessment, and also there's counseling for adherence. Then the follow-up in the intervention model happens at one week, two weeks, and then monthly until the end of therapy. At each follow-up visit, uh, children are screened for TB symptoms, critical signs, and also tolerability to TPT. And also, adherence counseling is redone at each of these uh, follow-up visits. If there is any symptom suggestive of TB during, during the follow-up visits, the children are referred to the health facility. So these are the results, and here I want to highlight the primary, our primary endpoint, which was initiation and completion of TPT. We looked at this population through different ways different analysis. So we did per protocol analysis, uh, intention to treat analysis, and all showed an effect, and they're all uh, significant. Um, and I just want to highlight the primary endpoint uh, on declared child contacts. We see that in the intervention group, intervention group we have 80% of children who start and complete TPT, and then in the control group, we have 62%. And this translates to a threefold 
um, odds ratio of completing TPT through the um, intervention model. We also looked at the cascade of care and we, uh, we see very well, so we have here the intervention group in red and the control group in blue. So um, at the screening level, we see that we screen a lot more through the intervention group. Then among those who are considered eligible for TPT, there's not a significant difference between the two models. But then for completion and um, after the follow-up period, we see that we have 93.5% of children who complete in the intervention model, and 76.7% in the control model, in the standard of care. We also performed an acceptability assessment through a qualitative study. Uh, to, so we asked patients, we asked care, caregivers, we asked health staff, community leaders, what they think of the intervention that was done. And they all uh, consider it's acceptable. Um, we also performed a cost effectiveness analysis. So we see that in this intervention prevented 15 deaths related to TB in Cameroon and 10 in Uganda. And the ICER, so the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, uh, was $620 per averted DALI in Cameroon and 970 um, in Uganda. Um, we also had ongoing discussions with national stakeholders who are convinced of the effectiveness of the, of the intervention. So we see it works. It's something that people want. Um, it's an intervention that is acceptable. It's cost effective. Uh, stakeholders are on board. Um, there have been other interventions in the literature with si similar findings, especially in Eswatini, with a 93% TPT completion. Um, under the community intervention, so it's very similar. Um, and the open question now that is not the scope of this project is how to fund these activities on the long term. So I don't have the answer to this one. If you want more information about this project, we have several publications that are already out there. Uh, there are many details that I cannot convey in 10 minutes. Um, so I will invite you to, to check this out. And I would like to thank all families affected by TB who participated in the study. The implementing teams in Epicenter and Barara, <clears throat> the implementing team in uh, Cameroon and EGPAF, coordinating team in Geneva, and the coordinating team in the IRD, um, led by the PI of the study, Marilyn Bonnet, who is also the best PhD supervisor that one could have. And thank you for your attention. Est-ce que ça marche Oui. Alors avant que l'on ait des questions dans l'audience, je vais lire deux Now, questions. Before we take questions from the floor, I'm going to take two questions from the same person online and we're going to try to answer these questions. She says, given the benefits and better results, it's closer to the patients in the community. So don't you think it would be time to apply these models also for patients who are currently considered as non-eligible, such as children, pregnant women, and people with Outcome. adherence problems so that we would have better outcome and uh, as in in stable areas patients could also benefit from these models wouldn't it be good to implement it as soon as possible for a broader group in this very specific context so yes um, we've said this before but of course we didn't have much time so we couldn't go into the details but yes indeed in order to have access to these differentiated models of care the people have to meet eligibility criteria which uh, have to do with adherence and uh, other criteria and of course mm, this was debate and I'm sure that this is still being debated how can we broaden the eligibility criteria I see Suna here in Uganda for example pregnant women we had a long discussions with the Ministry of Health are now eligible to these models and uh, I'll, I'll now hand over to Etienne. Well, I was not a speaker in the session. I'm just a moderator. But I think I would like to give the floor to Pascal because she said something at the end of her presentation. You must have noticed her last sentence. I'm sure she has things to share with us. And maybe we can continue the discussion after that. 
Well, it's uh, totally one of, our, one of our recommendations, especially in the context of Carnot, which is uh, very fragile, very unstable. So there are protocols which uh, have been formulated already for uh, differentiated models of care for high-risk patients or unstable patients. So it's one of our recommendations. Yes, we totally agree with this uh, comment slash question. And so I will pick up on that because I don't see any hands in the room. I think that the differentiating models of care were designed to meet specific needs of groups of population. What we see is that very often the main differentiated model, I mean, we could ask ourselves, is this really differentiated because it's longer times between visits and supplying three months of treatment? Shouldn't that actually be a standard of care that we should have everywhere? That's the first thing. And the second thing is that we tend to favor those who are already doing quite well. Because if stable patients, well, good. Because if you're a stable patient, you are lucky because you're getting an even lighter model of care. And then if you're having trouble, well, then you're having trouble. And so you will have to come back even more often, even though it's so difficult for you. So it, it, it poses the ethical question of care, actually. How do we design care uh, in order to have uh, uh, equality? of treatment or equity actually because it's those who need the most who should be helped the most and in that case it's those who need it the most who have the greatest constraints and I think that maybe we should need to think about that and the last question uh, uh, Cette question de this question des of differentiated models, they should not apply uh, to unstable contexts. Uh, and I think that's what's interesting in this work is that we uh, need to go and see in the places where it's hard, in places where MSF works, maybe we would need to go into a, even more complex situations than that. Because after all, Carnot is actually rather stable. And well, Uganda and DRC, well, that's something else. But in other situations for chronic diseases also, maybe we would need to go uh, further and see how we could implement that kind of model. But of course, it would ask a lot of questions in terms of models of intervention, and it is highly contextualized. There's a question here in the back of the room and another question there. I don't know where the microphone is, so please stand up if you have a question. I'm standing already. I want to thank you for those presentations. Thank you for the topic. Uh, question, but the microphone is off. Sur le modèle à Goma, about the model in les Goma, you presented the retention data. Je uh, vous écoute. Ouais. On a une idée sur qu'il y a des données of, une idée, une volonté do we have data les données M18, do we, are we going 24, to have data for M1824 especially post landing of the project juste uh, rebondir then, sur mes questions avec ce qu'on a vu comme résultat uh, tant en milieu what we saw et rural in terms of Goma. results in urban Carnot, and rural environments in uh, Goma and Carno What's the agenda then for MSF? All sections together to integrate these differentiated models. Sometimes they are called light models into the non-HIV projects. Non-HIV projects. Merci. Merci. Thank you. I will answer part of the question and then I'll hand over uh, to my colleagues for the second part. Now about Goma, yes, we could we could uh, have deeper analysis. We have we want to have a 12 months assessment to make sure that the, the patients were not lost to follow up. And of course, we could actually analyze the data. Uh, all the way to the closure because the project was handed over to the Ministry of Health. And for the second part of your question, it's a good question. I'm going to talk about Omabe in the west of Kenya for patients with hypertension. It's a type of model that we have, are also going to put in place. We are going to assess the deployment of this model for um, uh, hypertension patients and patients with other non-communicable diseases or chronic diseases, because I think it's also possible. Chris, you wanted to add something. I'll speak in English. Yes, sir. Um, so for, for Goma, I think, um, and not only for Goma. I mean, you asked a question, I think, more about the operational 
uh, intentions, I think, in, in MSF to, to want to uh, use the differentiated model of care in other contexts, but especially uh, in non-vertical projects. And what we mean by this, I think, for non-MSF people is projects where we are not only treating or focusing on HIV-positive patients, but on uh, we have other patients that we're managing, whether it's internal medicine, whether it's pediatrics, whether it's nutrition. And in fact, the link between these two is very interesting because from the moment that you start to do individualized care, you open up the possibility to actually include a lot of patients and provide access to services that normally or very often are absent. So what that means is that if someone can for the reasons of um, uh, transport, for reasons of time, for reasons of, I mean, people have expressed uh, that they have issues with um, leaving their business, or if he's a fisherman, etc., that they can send a family member, that they can send a member of the community, or someone who also is uh, going through the same pathology as they are, to say, okay, can you pick up my treatment for me because I cannot come, that automatically opens up possibilities for people to be able to have treatment. So. The idea, I think, first of all, is to, you know, to remove from our minds this whole notion of uh, a vertical approach to, to patients. I mean, the person in front of you could have HIV plus TB or plus uh, diabetes. They're, I mean, it's not a, a pathology, it's a human, which means that how do we approach them and how do we facilitate, so to speak, uh, the possibility to have treatment? So if, um, I think for us, I think uh, now that, uh, at least in MSF France, We've moved away more or less from these vertical projects and we try and now it's, for the moment I would say it's with limited success of integrating as much as we can HIV treatment in other types of projects. So where we have patients uh, who are being managed for other diseases and of course ensuring that one, they have access to their drugs and two, that this is included in their general package of care. So we have similar things ongoing I think in, in our project in Kenya we have this, uh, for example, if I, if I mention a project in Malawi where we treat cervical cancer, 40% uh, or, or sometimes even up to 50% of our patients that we see with cervical cancer are HIV positive. Uh, and of course, so the question is, what is their CD4 count? Are they on their treatment? And how are they being followed up? Thank you. Well, we don't have much time left, so we're going to take one last question. There was one there on the left. Thank you, Mahmoudouchi, MSF. My question is about the differentiated follow-up. I think it's interesting because maintaining HIV patients in the loop is really an issue that we have. So I was wondering, uh, in, how do you make up your groups in the differentiated model? Do, do you have an undetectable viral load on all patients? Like, do you make the groups after a period of six months? Because I think it would be fair, because you would have patients who all have undetectable viral load. Otherwise, the follow-up follow would be different. The second part of my question is about the groups the uh, groups for community follow-up. How does this work? Is this meetings? Uh, how, how, how is that uh, working, actually? Well, thank you. Thank you for those two questions now. The first question, yes, there are eligibility criteria in terms of the viral load. The WHO recommendations is that for uh, any patient to initiate the treatment, the first viral load must be measured at six months and at one year. So if after one year the patient has a suppressed viral load, he then will be eligible to uh, the, the program. He will be part of a community group. Now, the second part of your question, well, it depends. It's a good question. And um, in Goma, for example, we have a, a, a patient's association that helped us make up the groups, and they also helped organize the meetings. It was meetings that took place at a patient's house or in a church or in any other place that uh, was made available by the association. But uh, yes, it can be adapted, actually, to the context. In Carnot, I think uh, you had uh, another setup. Well, 
Just a comment about the follow-up. In Carno, we have very limited access to viral load. It's only available in the Carno hospital, so it adds another challenge for the patients who have to do uh, their uh, yearly um, viral load follow-up, especially when uh, they are decentralized patients, so the criteria are not always complied with, actually. And adherence, that's uh, quite subjective. It's the uh, therapeutic educator who will determine if the patient is uh, adherent and if he or she can be integrated in the models. We don't have a lot of information about the way they are trained, these people. Apparently, it's based on the patient's initiative. It has to be validated by the healthcare professionals, but we don't have exact and precise information about how uh, they are managed and how those groups are actually uh, uh, followed and monitored. Um, I think I'll ask a question to, uh, to Anka. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Ah, I see uh, Kathy over there. Yes, thanks very much. I wanted to also, um, first of all, congratulate Anka for that great work as part of this big CAP TV project, which uh, had a really fantastic results. So congratulations on that. And just comment also on your last point that it takes a lot of resources. And even with a lot of resources, if we take the example of our Philippines project where we do uh, contact tracing, we do preventative treatment, we don't have anywhere near that good results. So even with the resources at MSF, there are so many barriers to giving TPT, even to less than five-year-olds, but let's think about the other people who could benefit, people with chronic diseases, for example, uncontrolled diabetes or chronic renal failure. And also think about nutrition. Uh, recent studies showing that nutrition can really reduce the incidence of TB amongst household contacts. So there's a lot of resources needed. And at the end of the day, what we're missing actually are some good tools, isn't it? If we had a nice test that would tell us who will get TB after they're infected, then we'd be able to uh, treat a lot less people with TPT. Um, so I don't know if you have any point of view on those other factors that could facilitate the, the scale up of TPT. Thanks. Um, thank you for the comments. I agree with everything that you said. Um, yeah, so when we were doing the project, during our discussions, um, we kind of understood that if it's, if it's not put on the priority agenda for the global fund, it will not happen, basically, at a large scale. Um, it's very difficult to, to implement this kind of activity. Even, like, we, we didn't have a huge percentage of uh, TB detection within this population, but we know we prevented lots of cases because we actually gave TBT correctly and we had a very good completion rate. Um, there is a great question on subclinical TB. Um, who knows, would, sub, would TBT actually cure subclinical TB? Like these are, these are very um, many questions that are out there and we don't know the answer to for now. Um, and uh, yeah, another another comment, um, another thing that I wanted to add from from what you said is basically like there needs a global there needs to be like a global um, priority set on TPT for this. And we actually gave TPT only to children under five. Why aren't we giving TPT to everyone? So. Yeah, these are open questions, so a lot of work for us to do as a scientific community in the future. Yeah, thanks. Donc on a plus de temps pour des questions, mais si vous avez d'autres questions, n'hésitez pas. Okay, we run out of time for more questions, but during the breaks, lunchtime, you can discuss with the panelists. So we close this session. Thank you for being here today with us.